if we should be live for our first ever AIT online. No pressure. Live. Let me just double check because I would hate to be just talking with you when I could be talking with lots of other people. <laughs> And like true professionals, we can edit this later on. Yeah, we should edit it. Amazing. All right, doing some that. Oh, look at that. Boom. All right. Awesome. All right, then. Who are you? What are you doing? What am I doing? Um, yeah, I'm Mark. And uh, we're here today to do a live stream around uh, playing with DevTools um, on my beautifully crafted website, Automation and Testing to Online. Um, who are you? What are you doing here? Uh, I'm, I'm Richard. Um, I've come to do some pairing with you to see what we can do with the power of Chrome DevTools and exploring a bit of this awesome uh, playground that you've built. Yeah, I think like we've played a little bit with DevTools um, in training sessions and stuff. And I only recently discovered that like shortcut list thing on it which has revealed quite a lot of powerful different things on there so that's going to be quite cool to play with um and then yeah i guess we can sort of play around see if we can try some different things so let me get it up i think they call it a pallet a pallet yeah the control shift p they have the similar thing in a vs code and they call it a pallet in vs code yeah Clear so. site data from the command menu. Ah, so they call it the command menu. I think command shift P. Yeah, look at all that cool stuff. All right, well, we think we should start with some of the things we know. Yes. Seeing as this is our first stream, I don't want to get too flustered trying to explore something new. Yeah. So um, let's start with where you are. I can give you a few ways that I use this. Um, the elements. I don't know, do we call it a panel? Yeah, yeah, I'd call it a panel. Yeah, the yeah. element tab, panel, tab, something like that. I'm sure there's a proper name for it. Um, yeah, so obviously anyone who's been in the world of um, uh, automation and testing or written any sort of test automation, yeah, especially on the UI, you're probably pretty familiar with this element view. Yeah, although so, I think some people who aren't quite uh, familiar with the little find tab down here so you can oh, use nice, that yeah. so say like I was trying to find content I could do dot content and it'll do a, it'll do a string find but it actually does a element find as well so I use it I think it's quite handy for testing elements out you can also see on the very right down here oh just remembered by the way we are properly pairing so I have full control over Mark's computer as well Yep, he's it's exciting. You can see here there's two options. It's giving you two results. So it's picked up CSS and it's also picked up a match uh, on an element. Oh. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I think if you delete that, it told you you can also type XPath and a few other things. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So you can do stream. I, I don't really know XPath anymore, I suppose. So something like that would work? No. No, you're uh, close. You need a wildcard in there because you're that's root. Slash slash is the root of the HTML. Right. So I think the first one needs to be a wildcard. So something like that. And also it won't work because uh, no. So let's delete that. It should look like that. Yeah. But content won't work because it's not. That's not the name of an element. That's a class. Right. So you would need something. I don't know what you've got. You got any spans in there? Oh, likely. It would something. Oh, see, I haven't written one either. I think. It, there oh, you go. yeah, yeah. So that was that was the bell missing. <clears throat> but you don't want to write XPath, Mark. No. Let's be honest. Right, they're our last resort. If we're really going to go down to an XPath, we're in big trouble. And seeing as you wrote this application, <laughs> I would come to you and be like, "Excuse me, Mr. Developer, can you please write an ID for me?" And then you would tell me to go away and write my own. Or you'd tell me which file to edit, <laughs> and be, I'd have to write my own. You'd be surprised how many I've actually missed out. It's pretty appalling, to be honest. Um, but on that, yeah, um, basically I use it, you know, you right click on an element, and I'm sure most of you have done this. We inspect, and then we get to see the various tags. 
I also noticed recently, I don't know if you it'll let me do this, Mark, but you can zoom in on this. And you, you probably try it. You've got more control. Right. So how would I do that? I think it's com control command plus. Uh, control command plus. Oh, no, just command plus, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, is just in case you need that little bit of extra vision. Okay, I didn't realize it zoomed in the whole of the toolbar. I thought it just yeah. did the I mean, it, HTML. It, it, essentially, all it is is just a, it's just another browser page, like, yeah. in, inside it. Like, um, oh, like, like a Chrome, ex like any Chrome extension would be. Yep. So I use it for that, but then I also use it, for, like, generally just for some testing. I'm always curious to see if there's any hidden stuff. So you mentioned, you know, using this bar below. And I've been known in the past when testing a few things to see if there's any hidden inputs. Um, just because sometimes they can cause issues for things like screen readers or sometimes malicious websites are using them to capture data. Uh, so, yeah, I tend to have a look on some of the websites and test them. Uh, and also just to see if there's anything hidden that perhaps I can find ways to make it not hidden. Uh, so, yeah, I kind of... Uh, Use it mostly for finding out, finding out information about the makeup of the page. Um, I use it for quite a cheeky little thing, which is that sometimes when you get pop-ups like this um, on a site, which wants you, it's either got some sort of paywall or it wants you to accept something that I don't want to necessarily accept. So I quite like doing the whole... Uh, so take this. So basically everything in the overlay, all of that pop-up, exists underneath it so as i highlighting over it there um i like to just delete the element bosh and i've got access to the page mm. yeah interesting you ever had that any cause any issues like any like future javascript calls that are expecting that element to be there um uh, I wouldn't say expecting the element, but definitely like when it's supposed to have written cookies or something like that, that, that definitely yeah. screws it up. Um, Cause yeah, you're obviously using it in a way that's a design, like it's basically getting around the system. So, which I suppose actually from yeah. a testing perspective is quite interesting. If you are like one of those people, if you, well, if you are a tester who's working for one of those companies where they're trying to set paywalls up or, um, you know, that things like a lot of content publishing sites have, have requests to remove ad blockers and things like that. I actually saw a few tweets about that the other day. Um, someone saying, um, I, I'm surely not the only one who explores dev tools when I'm using real websites, like, you know, looking at the, well, we'll have a look at some of all these tabs in a second, but they were specifically looking at the the console tab to see if there was any errors, yeah. it's, <laughs> how, it's... how bad their coding was, or if there was any messages left in the HTML. If you, I know a few websites leave comments inside HTML. Yeah, um, yeah. Like looking yeah. for jobs and things, or come and work for us. <laughs> so. I do. I like. Um, I do find like I can't help myself if I'm on a website and something goes wrong. I have to get DevTools up. I have to look in the console and find out what's going on. Um, it's just, it's like. But while we're still in this tab, though, like, so obviously you built this tool, Mark. Hmm. So, well, you built Automation Tested Online. You didn't build Chrome Developer Tools. But no, no, I, I can't claim that. No. But how often do you use this panel on the sides when you're debugging potentially some of your React code or UI code? Like, if you're, if you're trying to get a div in the right place or you're styling slightly off? Uh, yeah, no, I do. I, I, cause... I do use a tool um, which is uh, Webpack DevTools so that every time I make a change, it refreshes the page, which is great when you're doing stuff with the JavaScript stuff, but it can get a bit irritating when you're changing CSS um, in an editor, then having to come back and then watch all the assets reload and stuff like that. So yeah, I, I definitely use the um, the element style section here. So if I'm, so for example, oh, this choose something let's say um i think actually this like this just general hotel room info here so something like the padding um i might do things around sort of testing the uh that or like yeah try 
trying to get an idea of what it is that I want to do with the styling. One thing I do quite like as well, though, so, so I can set a figure like this. And you see, we just saw a bit of padding bottom appear there. But actually, um, I can actually use the directional keys on the keyboard to yep. increment the value. And that's actually quite handy as well, because when you're sort of getting to that point where you're like, oh, I just want a little bit more, want a little bit less. Um, or say, for example, you've got like, like bringing it back to more of a testing context, if I can find the boundary of which, like, like how many pixels does this thing need to be before it breaks and overflows? Um, and then I've got a boundary there to sort of try and achieve. Like, you know, can I, like, I can obviously change it in dev tools, but can I do something else in the system to make that div increase? So I've used the same thing actually. I remember as an instance, I used it um, on Ministry of Testing when um, the dev there, Andrew, had uh, built a feature and I didn't quite like the padding on the pages. So I actually went and just played around with the padding myself, um, mainly because I knew how to do it and I knew what I was kind of looking for. And then in the message that I sent to Andrew, I just hinted that perhaps this might be a better uh, number for the padding. Um, because I'd seen it, but obviously we, I wasn't aware of any other impact that changing that may have had, like, you know, to different responsiveness and things. Yeah. Um, but it was more just to give him a bit of an insight, you know, that it was quite a significant change or if it, you know, sometimes it wasn't, uh, but also more from a point of view of knowing that it would be, don't really like the term, right. But like a quick fix, hmm. right. Cause I was able to do it. And to be honest, I probably, if I wanted to, I probably just could have gone and committed that change myself. Um, yeah. you know, especially if it's only like five, 10 pixels, something like that, and then save the whole, no need to bother Andrew, just get that in there. Uh, and uh, obviously I'd see it at the next uh, deployment. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that's quite a nice Very way. powerful stuff. Oh, I've remembered one more thing I used it from you scrolling down there. Before I got a Chrome extension to pick the colors, I used to use it to steal colors from websites that are like, <laughs> ah, yes, I would keep I would keep a list of the um, uh, the hex codes. Yes, um, so I, I could use them in future things. I used to do stuff with font families as well that way. But now, like one thing I've noticed now is that a lot of people use Google fonts. So looking up in the oh look at all that messy messy CSS, it's horrid. Um, but um, like looking in the header is quite handy because I can see. Uh, close that style down that style down there Ooh, all the styles have been opened up uh... oh no no I, well, so you, I used ah no I'm thinking of my own website so if I go on here real quick oh that we both do that on our blogs don't we with the Luna yeah the Luna one yeah so it's quite handy well I mean it's the same principle as like looking for libraries and stuff that are being used but it's quite handy like if I go inspect here cheeky little plug for my own website um but yeah so i can see things like uh which fonts sets are being used there and i can pinch those uh for my own own purposes but yeah nice. like like more useful stuff is like knowing which versions of jquery i can see which versions of bootstrap i'm on um yep and this is this is this in itself is quite interesting and actually maybe we, we can use this as an opportunity to go to like the network tab is um is that all of these different uh assets that are being pulled in are actually being pulled in from cdns outside of um the hosting for this so if we look at the network tab and we refresh now you can see that there's all these different bits and pieces that are coming from different sites and Another thing that's quite interesting to do is to uh, I don't know if I don't actually know if you can do this in DevTools, but like using other tools like uh, proxies like Charles to prevent these things from being downloaded and then seeing how the site deals with that. Because, um, yeah, yeah, I don't I think you can problems. in here. I, I think you can. Can you break point? Oh, you can block it. Yeah. So you can block. Oh, okay. uh, so let's so give it a go. Let's block block something useful like bootstrap and see yeah. what it looks like. Yeah, give it a go. Block the CSS one. So if we block uh, this one. Yeah. So we'll, we'll just block the whole domain. Cool. So we've got that up there. Give it a crack. <laughs> oh, that, that's beautiful, isn't it? Look at that. 
Very nice. Oh, that's very broken. Oh, yes. Do you reckon we'd sell many rooms if we uh, were to sell like that? <laughs> so, yeah, that's quite interesting, you know, because a lot of people are, you know, curious. Well, not curious. Like, if you're using a tool like React and you're making a lot of API calls, mm. you could even mimic the website being down. Um, so, yeah, we'll turn, we'll turn that off. Um, give that a new bit of a reload. There we go. We're back to normal. Don't know what all these are though. All these different four four nine PNGs. What are these? Uh, these are all the tiles that are used for the. Open oh, map. for the map. What? See, I didn't even know that was built up of little tiny images. Yeah. Oh, very clever. Hey, see, all ultimate. Yep. Um, yeah, because sometimes but... when the network goes out, you'll get like pieces of it and then you don't get other pieces or you get pieces that load correctly and then some are like really blocky sort of resolution because they've only half loaded all right yeah cool and and this point on the map uh for those of you who might be interested or just up here actually um is where the um greatest pub in the world is the uh, fat cat in norwich and i will not hear a single naysayer about that what about Norwich or the pub? Well, both. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so yeah, we can see lots of requests. Is there anything in here that looks interesting to you? Why? I know you built this, so you're expecting to see certain things, but well, like typically when I start using this, um, the things that jump out to me, um, well, I, I tend to use the filters. Um, okay. So using the XHR filter is always really interesting because that's that's requests after the page is loaded and it's pulling in different different information from different places so we can see here like branding and room get called quite a few times which is interesting i'm going to refresh this because um oh ah right so my developer hack came You've on there for a second i was like why why is it showing branding and room so many times but i think it's because i've ah yeah preserving the log so that's quite handy as well, like preserving the log uh, sometimes, but then sometimes it makes you think so if I refresh this now. Okay, so we can see that branding and room get called uh, once. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so these are interesting. So yeah, XHR, XML, HTTP requests is always handy. Sometimes it's kind of weird though, though, like Ajax requests, sometimes when they're made, go end up under other. And this can sometimes be an interesting filter to, to get stuff out of as well. But yeah, so selecting one of these, we can see the response. We can see some nice uh, JSON there. I wonder, is there any way we can prettify that? Can we? Um, I think you can. Is it Command B? Command B. <laughs> command B. <laughs> nah, Command B didn't work. <laughs> oh, well. But I think it's interesting, like, just for people who've never used this um, platform, as I said, this is a test website. It's completely open source. Um, you can download the source code. Um, and we'll, we'll, we can link out to it. But we happen to know that branding and room are some of the APIs that are driving this website. Um, so branding is responsible for all the things you see on the front page, the images, the titles, uh, the address, the name of the actual BNB. And obviously we can see that in the JSON, so we can check that it is appearing on the page. I did have a bug in one system a long time ago where uh, as the dev was building the website, She'd left in, um, so she'd hard coded some of the names and things while she was building it to see what it would look like. And then they never got mapped over to the API call after it had actually been built. <laughs> but I never noticed because I didn't realize that the text was hard coded. Um, so we didn't realize until someone tried to use it. And then I found a way of looking at the JSON and seeing that actually, yeah, we, we weren't um, using the, the parameter. Which is quite interesting. Yeah. So there's a bit before this though, Mark, if we just close this down, I think this view is quite interesting. Because mm. um, obviously we can see status codes. Um, we can see, I think obviously that's the type. So the, the type of thing that triggered the API call, I assume. Yes. I, know, I know that's what fetch is, but yeah. I don't really know what it necessarily means in this. So thing. if we change the filters, yeah, so we can see, yeah, so oh, it's the... Oh, it's the it's the okay. uh, content type, I would assume. Although it's kind of weird that fetch, it uses fetch rather than 
rather than like JSON or something like that. But I don't know. And then I was going to point on the size. I think the size is interesting. But now you're on this view. Obviously, I reckon every tester who's watching this or any tester out there has, has had issues with the cache in their time. So being able to see which things have been cached and which things haven't is really useful. And also this obviously disable cache button here um yeah. because then um, we can turn the cache off and make sure that we are getting a fresh download of the website there's been a several times where a css file or something's been cached on my side and you know the website looks beautiful to me yeah uh, but as soon as we ship it yeah this yeah, this, site, it's an issue. this site uses cloudflare and um that's screwed me over a couple of times actually where the apis have updated but the javascript hasn't um so there's not just caching on the browser, but there's actually caching in the in the in the um, the server that's serving this stuff. Um, I mean, I think finally the waterfall is quite interesting. Um, yeah, I tend kind to have of this off. the time people load. Yeah, so I, I tend to have this off, but I know they have this as default, and I know it could be quite useful for people. You showed me something the last time. Yeah, I'll show you that in a sec. Yeah, so really cool. There's a few, so yeah, I think like just to recap on this one though, seeing one more thing I wanted to pick up on was the size of some of your actual responses. Um, so, you know, if you're downloading really big images, you're obviously going to see an issue. And if your website's expected to work on a mobile and um, people are out and about and, you know, this image of this house here is four meg, uh, it's going to be a pretty weird experience. Um, and also you'll see like as it's downloading, it will be really slow. Yeah. So you can start to see some of that stuff in the logs as well, or in this uh, con network tab, which is quite yeah. cool. So you can see like a good demonstration of that. So if I disable the cache and I run this now, um, and if you look at main.js, um, oops, oh, that, that's kind of annoying that you can't kind of that. But if you see that one, like 218K, that's much yeah. larger than quite a lot of the other ones that are in there. Although the logo is quite large as well. <laughs> But um, I think now if, that's you, very large if you disable that, yeah, if you disable the uh, put that back, and you see at the bottom here, like 1.54 seconds, yeah, or a load time of 714. I wonder how it does. Yeah. Like nearly half. Yeah. Like yeah, ca there, caches yeah. are powerful things. Uh, yeah. So the cool thing I told you, showed you was this little record. Um, so if you turn on the record, and you do a refresh. Um, you get it's not really a good website for doing it. Let's uh, let's just get to BBC. Well, maybe do it. Uh, maybe the cache affected it. What, what if you oh, like, okay. disable yeah, the cache yeah. and then try again? Oh, you didn't. Oh, there you go. Cool. Uh, that's a bit better. So you get a little timeline. Um, that's a bit small, but you get a little timeline of everything that went on. So you can see we start by literally having the image. <laughs> And then magic happens. Oh no, it's kind of rendering the whole view. I don't know why it's so small. Is it because we? Uh... Can we do the command? What's the... Does that make a difference? No, I think we need to make uh, dev tools bigger. So if you go back to making it small, it won't show me the the draggy bar for some reason. Let me give it a crack. There we go. Yeah. Um... No, nope, still small. Never mind. What, what if we? Uh, can you not? Oh, that's a bit annoying. So you can't. Yeah, no, that's a bit sucky. Well, either way, if we click on one, we can basically click through how this website loads, um, and like set frame by frame, pretty much second by second, um, and you can start to see which assets load first. So if you were on a slow connection, um. You know what what kind of what you what experience would the user have yeah uh, depending on which would render first i don't know why that's not there. It's, it's a bit odd as well because if you actually look at this the first frame is it loads the image and then oh and I sp oh, when you click on it as well it shows what's like the timeline what's of what's been loaded it the timeline, yeah. but it's kind of weird like it shows the image at the start and then here it's loading the image again well i think it's actually the screenshots that's gone wrong i think mark because if you look ah, at this one we've, we've moved down the page 
So I'm not sure what it's doing. Normally you see a full screen image, but we seem to have been pushed down the page. But anyway, um, it's fun to use on something that's really heavy. Like I find BBC News is a great demo. You see uh, lots of weird rendering on there. And like YouTube's quite interesting as well. If you've ever used YouTube on a slow connection, they now show gray boxes instead of the text. Right. Which is quite quite interesting. So yeah, instead of rendering the name of the video, that they prioritize the rendering of the video frame over the rest of the screen. So like the side panel tweet, you know, the comments, the thumbs up, thumbs down, none of them render at all. Um, just the video renders. Oh, okay. Uh, and yeah, so that's that. Then there's one more thing I think that's useful on here. If we can just want to resize everything a little bit again. Yeah, let's bring this down let, a bit. Won't let me do it for some reason. So we're using a pairing tool. So as mentioned, um, I'm able to control Mark's computer. Yeah, he's only stolen like three of my account details, bank account details. So the throttling one was the one I was going to pick on. Um, so if anyone is, you know, wants to try, um, no, that's a bit annoying. We'll come back to that in a minute. We'll, we'll just go with one of the default ones. So if anyone ever does want to simulate like a slower connection, again, you can do that straight in Chrome DevTools. Um, and you can see, you know, how your page would perform. But um, one thing that I would say is uh, there's no substitute just for going out in the wild. Like throttling a connection is one thing, but when you're out and about, packages being lost, um, packages being dropped, uh, connection dipping in and out, your phone thinking it's connected, but it's not connected. <laughs> um all those kind of things but again it is fun to watch you can see that the website does load in a very interesting order and now we're waiting for this image like coming down line by line so yeah we're going to turn no oh, one thing always remember to turn it back off again <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> I used to use Charles so. Proxy for a lot of mobile testing, and I so many times I forgot to turn it off and was really confused why I couldn't do anything <laughs> on my computer. Um, yeah, that screwed you over. Uh, group by frame. What does that do? I suppose that's kind of similar to the the uh, frame recording thing as well. Ah, uh, cool. Um, one last thing I always do, like it's it's. it's so I don't really use Chrome very often these days, but I still kind of use it for testing. And like the first thing I always turn on in the network tab, but it, it baffles me that they don't have this as default is if you right click, you can actually set what you're showing in the uh, table and uh, method is never enabled. You have to turn that on yourself. And I just think that's crazy. Really? Uh, yeah. Just gonna flip and have a quick look at mine. Uh, da, 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 inspect. Network. Reload. Oh yeah, I don't have any method. Yeah. Oh, very good, very good. All right, then let's pick a new tab. Um, let you pick one, let's, I think. I think let's also look at a little different part of the application as well, because hidden away is the admin panel with the very secure password of password. And you have to click the button because enter doesn't work. Uh, no, I don't want to save the password. Uh, cool. well, what if you forget the very secure password? <laughs> <laughs> you look at the readme documentation. That's what you do. <laughs> So just for um, summary, like this tool is, again, it's designed for practicing automation. So obviously there's a UI you can see here, there's a whole suite of APIs underneath it. It's written in React uh, to try and be, you know, a bit more current and modern with the tools that we're using. Um, but also behind the scenes, it's, there's lots of other pages as we're about to look at, but it is designed to basically replace a and b booking engine. Um, we have a little story that we use in our training. Uh, about you know old old style B and B's just keeping a diary on their desk, and we built this system to to replace it. Um, but yeah, it's a fully functioning system. It does things, uh, and yeah, it's a great playground. It's nice nice for you to say it's fully functioning. Um, 
<laughs> it's it's not without its foibles and bugs every now and then. Actually, I wanted to show you a screenshot. I've been meaning to show you this for ages. But uh, so we've got um, a new feature in Report where when you hike, like click and drag over, you can see a pop up here. And you might notice that the calendar disappears from behind. And then when I click cancel, the calendar comes back. And that's because if I show you this, um, this is what happens if you. Um, <laughs> uh, <no. laughs> so the only way I could get around it was to disable the um, the calendar. That's a Firefox issue, surely, right? Uh, no, I think it was on both. I'm not. I'm not quite sure. I just took one look at it. And went. Oh, I'm not dealing with that. <laughs> just turned it <laughs> off. It was just easier. It's um, kind of a nicer experience because I'm guessing the calendar reloads anyway. Because yes. you push new data in there. So yeah, it does. It does. Okay. So right. what about another door? That's back to the dev tools. Um, it's going to have to be the console tab with? because that little, console, ooh, this the holy little one error has been bothering me since we started about half an hour ago. So I can either wow. click on the consoles tab or I can click on the error. Oh, right. Cool. So let's click on console tab here. So we've got it in full view. So this is, this is an expected error because it's basically, uh, you're trying to log in, um, or the app actually has to find out whether or not um, it's lo in a logged in state or not. So it has to call to the endpoint auth validate. And uh, if it sends either no details or incorrect details, it gets a 403 back and logs you, keeps you logged out. So for context there, I know we're looking at a different tab right now, but if you go to application, I don't know why I can just do it myself, but <laughs> is it because you had an old token? Uh, no, it, it will just send it regardless. So what happens? It will just send like again. So this is a bit rough, rough and ready around the edges. It actually sends all the uh, cookies um, to the endpoint. So what it will do is it will look for token and it will either say, um, is it blank or is it null? Then return a 403. If it's actually got a value, then compare it against stored values inside the API. Um, and okay. if that doesn't match, turn a 403 then. Wait, so it could be possible to look for a token, look look to see if that cookie exists before calling validate? or Yeah, so I, I can't quite remember actually in application if you can, you, no, you can't add cookies in, but you could arguably add a token in and see what happens there. But yeah, like I, said, I don't think you can create tokens using this. It's kind of only view only um, or deleting. So here's a challenge for you then, Mark. Can you use the console to add a cookie? Oh, you can. Oh, so if I refresh now, yeah, I'm logged out because the token's incorrect. Ah, oh, so that's new. So now- no, I think this. you've always been able to edit them. I just don't think you can add Ah, I see. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, you, you yeah. can always edit them. Oh, wait, no. What? <laughs> <laughs> Take it all back. Take it all back. Oh, so this is why we... This, so, when we, so when we had this idea of doing these, you know, these um, twitches, one of the things we were doing, so this was a typical sat in a bar just saying we should do more things and you, there's never any time to do more things. Hmm. But we both agreed that we both explore tools in our own time. So why not do it together and share it? And we both actually said, we guarantee we're gonna learn something every Twitch. <laughs> Cause I've been using the little cookie um, plugin. Yes. Can't remember what it's called, but it's, it basically is a picture of a cookie. And it always makes me want cookies, but either way, um, it's now good. It's good to know you can add cookies in here. Yeah, that's that does make life a little easier, if I'm honest. Um... So while we're in here, we might as well stay here. So yeah. let's, um, obviously a lot of people know what cookies are. Um, if you're doing any sort of web testing and you're not familiar with them, you probably want to um, uh, find out what they do and have to see what, web, see what cookies your website has. So I know there's two key ones for this website and they're both right in front of you now. Hmm. Um, a token is how we know if, if you've logged in, you'll have a token. Because uh, like I said, it's a very secure application. Uh, and the welcome one, when you, the start of this Twitch, if you were watching at the start, you would have seen that little overlay that appeared when we load the website. Uh, you can use this cookie to stop that showing. Um, so 
It's quite interesting, actually, Mark. If you set it to false, would it show it you? Uh, it wouldn't I... show it to you now, but if you if you edited it now, so double click false and then refresh the page. Well, if I go to the home, yeah. Home. Well, it doesn't matter where you go, really. So I was wondering if you see it just looked for a cookie called welcome, or did it actually care about it, its value? Ah, uh, no, it does. Yeah, it just it just yeah, it just looks for the existence of the cookie rather than the value. Shocking, Mark. Shocking. <laughs> All right, let's get back into the admin uh, panel. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so I'm not gonna. Yeah, I'm not, it's probably not worth me doing much on this bit, Mark, because that is pretty much all I've ever used this for. Mm. But do you have any better things you've used this panel for? I literally use it to look at cookies. Um, and I have used one website a while ago that used local storage um, for filling in, you fill in a field, it would store them in the local storage. Yeah. Um, but we don't seem to use them on this particular website. No, no I, I don't really use it very much myself as well. Some interesting frame stuff here. Oh, cool. So you can actually see. So these are all the. All the calls the that have been made so far. Made. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the stuff that's been stored in them. Oh, that's quite cool. So you can look at the. Stuff. So I know uh, one of my one of my uh, old developer colleagues used to use this a lot and he used to be able to map this file. Um, to his local machine somehow, or he used to edit stuff in here in real time. Oh, okay. And change uh, things as he develops the uh, screen. Yeah. Well, I know. I know npm. Ah, uh, not npm. Sorry. Um, uh, Webpack DevTools does that for you now. But uh, that's quite that's quite funky if you can do that. The thing is though with this view is I always get confused between application and sources because sources is is really powerful as well so um, you can use this so you can click this pretty print here and it just sort of kind of explodes out so this is my, this is like the main javascript code for the ui uh, um, you could do that's what I think. It's, it's been minified that's the thing i'm, I'm going to ignore your uh your Look how ugly that javascript is you're just so bitchy about javascript just get over it it's amazing um, but we should see if we go down a bit more. Uh, Actually, I think you're right. You know, I think this is the screen that it, it used a lot because you can put the breakpoints in and yeah. the callbacks. Yeah, this is the yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's like it, it's uh, every t every now and then I look at this and I think I should use this more because it's a really powerful t a powerful um, tab or panel, whatever it is that we're calling it. But it is. Um, I, I don't know. There's something about it. Just I, I haven't really sort of. Max age should be a number. Throw it. Hmm. I think this is slightly out of date. This uh, this UI. Anyway, um, yeah, it it's pretty powerful, and you can do like you say, like breakpoints and stuff like that. And you can actually like if you get errors in the console, you can actually. Um, you can click on those and they'll bring you into the sources tab so you can actually see like what part of javascript is uh, has gone a bit screwy yeah. i imagine it'd be easier on a slightly like i know if you i know we're using um i know you're using i can't remember what it's called now which packages it up to one massive javascript file yeah that's where but i also yeah webpack i know a few applications still keep their individual files um, so obviously, then it would be you wouldn't have thirty-two thousand lines of JavaScript. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and the rest. Who, who knows what that does? No one knows what all that does. I reckon well, this, any JavaScript this, guru. This has all been minified. Um, if this was in a developer environment, you'd like these functions would all be written out correctly, and you should, you'd be able to view them properly. But this is like this is like everything. This is all of the React. Um, uh, code as well, and then all of my code that uses React yeah. and uh, all sorts of other stuff. So, um, yeah, it can be a bit of a pain to use. Yeah, I've got. Oh, that's it, really. Just it's a pain to use sometimes, but I, I think it's quite powerful. 
so like from obviously sticking our testing hats back on because like obviously with mark building this so we can easily um shift into that focus but again we've moved to the sources tabs but you can still see down the left you know all the different calls that were made if you've ever got a test analytics um, you know you can see a lot of the different calls that are being made to um, analytics or the javascript files that are being used um which is quite interesting and then as we mentioned on the right you can do breakpoints and stuff but probably more if you're interested in doing some development or perhaps debugging something and you you know you've got the skills to do that yeah well i know um viv richards um he's he's been doing some workshops and putting some material together around getting a bit more de into more detail into some of these panels and i know he's definitely looking at the sources tab and he's he's a big advocate for 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 using uh, sources because he does it he uses it for like bypassing javascript validation which is quite cool all right so let's take us back to the console because i think the console is one of my preferred um yeah one of my preferred tools and i honestly don't really know an awful lot with it i can tell you what i use it for but let's uh let's uh let's have a watch let's, let's watch you have a play with a few things just seeing andy jones is asking if she uh, what the url is she wants to chip in and have a little note have a little butchers Woo! <laughs> um oh the url to the site or uh no i've given it on to the twitch um oh, twitch. cool so, so it's like mark can you tell me what you literally just did and what actually happened uh magic you're welcome. Magic. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, so the console tab is basically it's the output for the JavaScript engine that lives within uh, Chrome, but it's also um, it allows you to access the JavaScript and trigger off stuff. So if I did something like document, um, the first thing is you notice it all goes blue up here, and that's basically because it says document is referring to everything on this page. Um, so if I hit enter on that. Um, and then kind of, I think if you alt click, oh yeah, you alt click. So that gives me all the HTML that exists. That's basically, that's the document object model of the page. Uh, the DOM. Pretty cool, the DOM. Um, so like when I called alert, alert is a JavaScript function to make, um, to make alerts appear. So I can do something like that. And, and that's how that popped up there. Um, so you're basically triggering, like obviously, alert being a very common JavaScript. Um, you know, it, it exists in most JavaScript like libraries, or does it exist in just in Chrome, pretty much? Um, so I think Firefox has like a similar thing to this, but they lock it down a little bit more. But what they have is like uh, they call it the JavaScript scratch pad or something like that. Okay. Um, so you can have like an actual panel up on the right hand side um, that does does it something like that. So a quick look. I think it's. Uh, yeah, so. Well, Mark, Mark, while Mark loads that, obviously, if you get familiar with doing something in um, any of the dev tools, um, probably the likelihood is that you know there'll be an equivalent in Firefox, or if you're familiar with Firefox, there'll be an equivalent in Chrome. Yeah. Or if you really have to, you use Edge, or you know, if you might still be a, an Apple uh, lover and you stick to Safari. But either way, whatever browser you're using, they most of them have um, some form of developer tools. So that runs and then display. It's, yeah, so they, they've oh, got their okay. own version of it and stuff. I, I, to be honest, I don't really like that. I, like, but that's just because I've really spent a lot of time with it. But what I quite like with this is, uh, well, there's two parts of this. Is first of all, you can interact with the site. Um, so we could do something like, let's inspect this button. And so it's got an ID of create room. So if we do document dot get element by ID. So now well, before you type on that, if anyone who ever used Selenium, I'm not saying you should, but if you've ever wondered how it works under the hood, um, a lot of these things literally do channel down to, you know, straight up console tools. Well, that's, uh, that's kind of where Selenium came from, wasn't it? It, it, would, it is, it yeah. yeah it's before this, before, it went in, before the web driver backing came in. So if we run this, I get some details. So I can see here, I get uh, some details on the element and I can actually hover over it and it hovers over on the right here. And then if I do this, I think I can just, I can't quite remember what the, 
There we go. So I clicked the button via JavaScript. So I don't know if anyone saw on Twitter the other day. Um, a long time ago now, uh, it was no assessment's fault, but we thought we'd load up loads of inspirational quotes as the Slack loads for Ministry of Testing. So I, um, I wrote a Selenium script, funny enough, to enter them all one by one because there was no API call. However, a few weeks ago, we decided that we wanted to delete them all now and like use it to make people aware of who Team Ministry of Testing is. So I use JavaScript to, to delete them all. And <laughs> um, so I pretty, I exactly use what you've just written there, and I wrapped it in a small loop. Um, and I worked out the locator, and I said for every um, response for this query, just keep clicking the delete button, and I deleted them all in about 12 seconds, which. Well, I don't think it was even 12 seconds, to be honest, but either way, it was a lot quicker than it would have taken me to click, scroll, click, scroll, click, scroll, click, scroll. Um, so. Yeah, so you can do funky things like this. Stick it in a for loop and there you go. I just clicked, I clicked that button 10 times really quickly. You've got no room ID. Got no room ID. Yeah, and that's I... that's where the this this example kind of reaches its breaking point because in React, there's this idea of, um, I think it's controlled state. So, um, should we, shall I install the React DevTools? A little play uh, maybe not right now. No? But, nah, I think like, just, just finish the console. So, yeah. one of the things that I tend to use it most, and we've just seen an example of doing it on the Elements tab, but to be honest, I kind of prefer just to be in the console. So um, I tend to use a lot of CSS selectors uh, and you can practice um, CSS selectors. I don't know any IDs we have on there. I'm guessing you might just have room ID as a guess. Row would do. Oh, you've oh. got create room there. We'll just do create room. Um, so if you're not familiar with um, CSS selectors, the little hash means ID. And then you should be able to do similar things like that. Yep. And we got one result, and we can see that the one result we got is the same button. And you can see again, it, click on it, it highlights it, so it takes you to it. And if you just hover over it, you can see it flashing up there at the top right. Well, you I also recently learned. I was going to say the dollar dollar thing. Yeah. Oh, that's pound signs, wrong country. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> let's, uh, let's try, let's just stay in the EU for a little second. Oh, no, we're out of the EU now. <laughs> I don't know what I'm typing anymore. Um, but yeah, apparently uh, you can do um, dollar dollar. But someone on Twitter told me uh, was well, what's the fancy version of JavaScript, Mark? Uh, well, I won't call it e fancy. ECM summit. Oh no, no, it it, it's why well, it's not a version of Java. JavaScript is a version of ECMA script. Uh, okay, well there you go. Um, so actually, did you notice? That was quite an interesting. Yeah, it thing. auto filled it in, didn't it? That was no, no, cool. it's showing you the result before you enter it. Yeah, yeah, sort of fills in the details so that you could actually go, ah, oh, right. Well, now I know that this is like an array or something like that. I could do like square bracket zero or something like that. Oh no, I meant as in it's like it's telling you if your select is any good as you type. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Like, so if I do that right. now, I can start doing zero and ah, oh, I've got that specific because yeah, yeah, it's yeah. telling me that this is this is an array with um, yeah. So length, if you auto fill length or. So the reason why I, this guy tweeted me though as well was because I'd written a horrible for loop with a list because I didn't know any. Oh no, actually, let me re, let me go back. So I ended up doing what Mark had just showed us with the for loop here. Um, because my JavaScript skills, there isn't any, I don't, they don't exist. Um, so I, I was Googling how to do a, a for loop in JavaScript and for each was the answer I kept getting. And every time I tried to use that, it, it was never an option on the, the list I had. And I can't remember the reasons why, but it's something to do with an array versus a list or versus whatever. Um, so he told me now that, yeah, if you do dollar dollar, you get like a proper ECMA list that you can then use the for each method on so like we could continue what mark did and do dot click i guess or something like that but either way we're not going to finish that 
But uh, use the first one up here, the create row, where yeah, I use it to test my selectors to make sure they're um, they're genuine. And especially if you know if you're running the script and you get told that you're no such element found, then I'm like you know straight in here to see if my selector was good or bad. So pretty powerful console. Um, what about fetch, Mark? Uh, right, yeah. So fetch. If I type fetch, we kind of already saw it briefly um, because we saw it mentioned in the network tab here. So all these things are type fetch. So fetch is basically it's an API. Oh, well, not an API. It's an HTTP request and response library that exists uh, within the browser. So you can actually. Um, so when when we make our requests to the API within the UI, that's actually using the fetch library. But what's cool about that is we can actually use that elsewhere. So let's do a quick demo of that. Um, well, uh, let's see what happens if we just do HTTP google.com. Uh, you get a promise. So I'm going to cheat a little bit and get, I'm going to do the, the good old, here's one I made earlier. Um, oh, page. they're saved in Firefox now. Yeah, I recently made the move um, from Firefox to uh, from Chrome to Firefox, and uh, I'm not ashamed of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So, so what, what you pasted there? Like, can you walk us through that bit by bit? Yep. So uh, the fetch here—that's the library. That's the um, HTTP request library. Um, and then what I'm doing is I'm basically building the U URL, um, but I'm actually using some JavaScript to get the host name and the port because um, I wanted to be able to use this across different environments and different environments like localhost versus automation and testing online. Um, and then it's going to auth login. Then I send it a JavaScript object which has the following values in it. So I set the method to be post. I drop some headers in there as well. So I need to put an accept and a content type. And then I put the body in. And then the body is actually a JSON object that I'm sending to the API. So I have to basically create a JSON object and then pass it as a string to fetch. Um, and that's actually, that's the, that section is the request. Um, but f uh, this is where it gets fun. Um, fetch returns a promise back. Um, so we have to kind of, call dot then to do something with a promise. Um, so I'm calling it and saying, turn the response body into a JSON file. And then once you've turned the response body into some JSON that I can use, then console log it out. So if I run this now, um, it does not work. Oh dear. So you're on login though, right? Oh, you've must be served over HTTPS. You're absolutely right. Let's do that. There you go. Bosh. There you go. So, so there's a few practical uses, uh, usages for this um, that we've done on, um, well, it's doing running this class. For example, um, Mark, uh, he'll explain in a second. So we've been able to like add rooms. So we've come on here and we actually want five rooms instead of four. So of course, instead of one, of course, we could just sit here and start filling all this information in. Or we could have a history of fetch commands and just fire four of them off and we'd magically have four rooms once we refresh the screen. Yeah. yeah exactly. um, or an example here is you know, just getting a token so we can um, use that perhaps in some of our other testing. Yeah. But um, you, you know a little hack for these that I think, I'm not sure if you got it from Alan, but I know Alan Richardson has shared this in the past. Um, but you saved them as something. What do you do? Um... I don't, I don't know who I got. I can't, I think, might have been Evil Tester, actually. Yeah, that's what I said, Alan Richardson. Yeah, sorry. That's his real name, by the way. If you didn't know his real name, Mark, his name's Alan. Yeah, yeah. we've yeah, I've never met him before. <laughs> um, <laughs> he used to live but on the corner. He did used to live on the corner. <laughs> that's good. Um, uh, yeah. But yeah, so, what can you save them as? Uh, bookmarklets. So you probably saw that very briefly when I jumped on here earlier and went to properties here so um, if you um, add JavaScript colon and then some JavaScript in you can actually run it as a uh, run like it triggers the JavaScript within the URL um, 
Unfortunately, Firefox have this kind of locked down a little bit. Not unfortunately, it's probably for good reasons, but uh, you can do it in Chrome. Sneaky demo. Cool. And if we do that. Oh, hang on. I need to be on a site. Let's try that. Don't say JavaScript alerts, unless they've turned it off. Cool. So there I'm actually running the JavaScript in the URL. Um, and because I can run it in the URL, I can save it as a bookmark, which turns it into a bookmarklet. So the same code is here. So if we get the, because we're console logging stuff out. Um, if I run this here and I go up here and I select login token. Ah, and it's not, I need to update it to be properties. HTTPS. So that's something I could change slightly is do window location and then maybe get whether or not I'm on HTTPS or HTTP, but let's click save on that. And the reason it's not for people wondering is um, when we do our training, we, we're running this locally. So most of the time we're not on a secure connection. So that's why they're saved as HTTP. So there you go. You can see we can call them one by one. And one thing me and Mark have spoken about in the past is having your data creation code for your actual real system behind an API. And then you can literally just save bookmarklets to create test data for you whilst you're doing your exploratory testing. Uh, you know, like as they, as they, exactly like Mark's doing there, just click on the drop down, boom, create room. Um, oh, he's got the same error though. Let's just fix them on the fly. So, you know, I actually wanted to do, you know, I need 10 rooms to do my testing. Actually, we'll do five, Mark. <laughs> we need five rooms. Four, five, and then I refresh the page. Whoa! So you know, just like think of a few examples. You know, you wanted to see big amounts of data, or you just you know you you've saved like an old. Perhaps you found a bug with a certain character, so you just want to quickly create a, a room with that funky character. You could save that bookmarklet to save you typing it all in again and see if it works this time. So yeah, they're pretty powerful things. Yep. So um, well, let's we're still to... in Firefox yeah. now, so. Let's get back there, cool. Uh, and obviously the other thing with the console, which we, we kind of brief hit on, is obviously this number of errors. Um, I always, first thing I always do is look there to see what kind of errors are going on. And 99% of the time, I haven't got a clue what it is. Um, so I turn to trusted Google and you know try and work out what the errors are and then obviously over time once i get familiar with an application i start to learn the kind of common things that are cropping up uh, and it can be quite useful to capture and you can you can actually save some of these so if you if you click on one of them uh, you can copy the error uh, and then that's obviously quite good for your bug reports and things like that be pretty useful to uh, to the developers yeah it's it, um, the other thing as well. I say but I like using the console tab for is if I wanna if I wanna test out a small idea in JavaScript that like if I'm writing something in Node but I don't really want to turn the whole app on just to test like you know like a, a for loop or a, a, a complex if statement or something like that I can actually run it inside here um, and and do similar. So I've got two more things I use in DevTools, Mark. One of them is mobile, and the other one is the palette view. I don't know if you've got any more than that. but uh, No, I was going to talk about React, but um, I think like, time's getting on, and I think the, the yeah. things that you want to show are going to be much more useful. Oh, it's not good in mobile, is it? Oh, I can do it. Hey. <clears throat> Uh, no, it's not, Mark, but that's not our concern. So the little mobile icon here, it never used to be there for many years. They've made it nice and easy to find. But yeah, you can um, choose from a drop down of uh, relatively common phones. I really think they need to update some of these, but you can add your own. Um, you can add your own list down here and add custom devices. So you can basically add the list of phones that you want. Where's Nokia 3310? <laughs> oh, I wonder what React would do in a Nokia 3310. It would melt it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you basically pick a screen size and then you can kind of see what your phone would look like. It does tend to re-render, but I depends on your website now. If you've got a responsive website, 
then it will just automatically you know re um, resize itself but if you've got an adaptive website which means the server's deciding what html comes back then you'd have to refresh your page but again you'd know that from your own context and there you can obviously rotate it around um, you can zoom in and out if you were uh, you know if it's a bit too small for you to see uh, but you still get the same view so again really good a uh, useful tool for you know having a quick look at what certain responsiveness looks like. Again, it's no real substitute for testing it on a mobile phone um, because you might get the look and feel of the website. So you can see Mark's menu change there at the top. It became a little hamburger menu because he's moved to a mobile view. Um, so you can start to test stuff like that. And um, but um, to obviously, it doesn't really simulate. So you can see, um, I don't know if it's your mouse, Mark, if you put your mouse over there, I'm not sure if mine's doing the same behavior. Oh no, it's not doing it. Sometimes when you're on a certain view, uh, you'll get, your mouse will be look like a little, turn into a little circle. I don't know why it's not doing it. And that's the reason why I still insist people at least do some testing on devices because pressing that button with your finger will be very different than pressing it with a tiny little accurate mouse. Uh, so I still encourage people to um, to uh, still try a real device. But it gives you a quick view. Tells you if it looks good or not. I used it very heavily when I was uh, rebranding my site, uh, my personal site. And then someday I will make this um, a little bit more responsive, but uh, <laughs> not right now. But while we're on this screen, the final thing I wanted to show you was um, Command Shift P was it, Mark, or what was the little shortcut? Uh, yeah, Command Shift P. Yeah, so Command Shift P opens um, what did they call it? The command something? Command panel or something like that. Yeah, the command panel. Um, basically, I only learned about this. Oh, wasn't that long ago. It was a good couple of months ago, maybe. Hmm. Um, bring that back up again. And you can literally scroll through endless number of things that you can do um, with Chrome DevTools. And I, I actually did the a few weeks ago, just click and just started reading down, to see what random things you could do. But the one that caught our attention originally was um, capture full size screenshot. Uh, and what it will do is it will, what well, does that? <laughs> but it will literally take a full screenshot uh, and there you go, you can get an endless, full page screenshot. Obviously there's lots of Chrome extensions that people use. Uh, I think we had one the other day which was called Greenshot. Um, but interestingly, it gave it the name of the device that we're on, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, but also if you're not in a mobile view and you've got a bit of a busier page, it will just go all the way down. Try the front page. That's a good example. So, was it uh, print? No. No, nope, screenshot. Screenshots, capture full size screenshot. Nice. There you go. And again, you know, evidence, test evidence, bug reports, stuff like that. And I know there's, there's like I said, there's endless ways. We're not telling you should use this one. Um, but if you like being in the tools and the dev tools, which I, most of the time I am, um, I found it a nice, easy way of just uh, playing around with it. And obviously, there's a few other ones like that probably won't do anything because we're not on a node. But I imagine if we were on a node, I wonder what it would do. So let's inspect the image. See, this is what we, so actually, this is a good time to say what we will be doing with these future Twitters. We are actually going to use these for things that are new to me and Mark. So we did, we do, hey, it did do the element I was picked on. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, it only showed half of it. Did it? it yeah, because it only did like what was visible. Uh, oh, okay, interesting. So what we're going to be doing on these future ones is like picking random tools. Um, you know, even commercial tools, open source tools, 
uh, mainly framed around like doing different types of automated um, automated testing and um, streaming them as we play with them. We know they're going to be tools that we've not seen before. Um, we may have already installed them. You may actually go through the process of installing them. They might be standalone tools. They might be frameworks that we you know we've downloaded. You know, thinking, for example, like. Cypress te test project testing, the latest version of Selenium and things like that. We might mix it up with languages. You know, we're not both not very strong with Python, but at the last AIT, people are all over Python. Yeah. So, you know, maybe we'll try and do some API automation in Python or something. But either way, it's going to be me and Mark focused around the tool and trying to spend an hour to get it to do something. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, try and get to do some magic. Suggestions of tools would be really awesome. So if you want to uh, tweet us, um, that'd be really awesome. Um, and give us an idea of some tools that you'd like to see as well. Um, we've got quite uh, quite a long list um, already in our heads. But um, you know, if some are sort of mentioned and given a bit of a shout out, then we'll uh, certainly uh, make them a priority. If um, I wanted to tweet you, Mark, how would I do that? You would use Twitter. Um, <laughs> uh, so you can follow me at uh, twitter.com 2bit 2nit 2nit 2bit tester that's me fantastic took that photo myself the one of very the good, mountains not the good. one of myself the selfie uh, and you can find me at uh, friendly tester who I've started typing to see what happens oh no it didn't work yeah, cool. I think like one of us grabs focus over the other. So, and we are going to be doing them as you've seen. Again, if you've not quite noticed, uh, we are literally pairing. Um, I again, I have full control of Mark's computer. So once we are perhaps doing something in a more um, coding framework or an IDE, uh, we'll mix it up and we'll um, we'll share the uh, code writing skills so we can watch how many typos the other person makes. <laughs> Yeah. But apart from that, I think that's that's a good time to end. So yeah, Chrome so. Developer Tools. If you've not played with it, strongly encourage you to have a look if you're in the web context. And um, it's really powerful. And we've only just scratched the surface. So if there's oh, there's a mailing you list use, as well. Yes, there is. Um, the Umar, I think his name's Umar. But yeah, like, again, let us know, and like we'll we'll tweet some of these things out if you're um, if you're doing some cool things. Uh, yeah, that's the one. That's yeah. the one. If you're doing some cool things with um, dev tools, be it Chrome or Firefox, you know, let the let the community know, uh, because the more people share these things, the better. Cool. So I think we'll call it uh, call it a night there, and um, uh, we'll be back soon. I, well, I guess it'll be a little bit because uh, Richard's off to Scotland, so um, you have to find somewhere with some internet before we can crack on with the next one. Well, I think we'll try and do them every two, every two to three weeks, something on those lines. Um, and yeah. Should be good. All right. Thank you, Mark. I'll see you soon. I'll catch you all later. See you later. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.